Mic check one two, mic check one two. Welcome back to the Agassi Nozinga Show, episode number one two four, with me, your host Agassi. How you doing? How you feeling? What's going on? Back again, um, a bit later than promised from the last podcast. I think I was meant to get out on the same day, but you know, better late than never and all that malarkey. Um, and here I am. It's night time here in the middle of Stratford. Um, area called maryland the exact location i will spare you the detail because it's not necessary or um it's not your fucking business right now but i'm here sitting down um winding down the evening i've got a nice glass of white vino here in my little glass that i'm going to be sipping along with as i uh recount some of the topics that i stumbled upon the last couple of weeks so Whatever you're doing, strap yourself in tight, grab your favorite drink, um, I don't know, um, walk slow and concentrate to my nice tones as they come through your headphones or earphones or other audio output devices on my voice to travel airwaves and your eardrums. Here we go, episode number one for the excellent show, cracking right on in so um i spoke a bit um the other day on episode number one two three a super stupid short episode i might not I, I'll, I'll, I think going forward i might try and just like keep all the uploaded episodes to a minute an hour and not do any short ones i feel like cheating just chucking them out there a bit willy-nilly going forward that could be a step to take action I did feel a little bit dirty putting out a podcast episode, but hey say la vie but anyway, um, since yesterday or since the last podcast, um, it's transpired now that the rapper known as Six Nine, um, some refer to him as Takashi Six Nine, has now been moved to a different um facility, um, in his ongoing federal case. Um, I think I might mention it in the last podcast, but it did seem like because you know there were there were stories coming out when he got arrested. Um, that he was going to be placed into general population, right? So he's going to go into prison. He's going to go to jail, I guess, for, in gen pop, fixing you know all the random scumbags of the earth, right? Whilst he's away at his trial, which usually isn't the way things go when you're somebody of uh, notoriety of someone well known, right? If even if you're even if you're, I'd imagine even if you were a well known underground crime lord, right? They or that wasn't that wasn't um known to, I don't know, that wasn't known to the everyday man on the street, right? say just like you know someone that people knew on the streets but you know, pablo escobar i'd imagine they'd want to not put you in gen pop either because you know ability in population could stumble across or you could be put into you could put into you put in close vicinity with people who want to do you harm you know fellow gang members people you might have slighted in the past you know just the usual uh gems of that whole underground uh society right so it did seem quite weird that they were arresting six nine for racketeering charges, right? They threw they threw the absolute book of charges um at his um to, to himself and his co defendants from members of, you know, Trey um and Trey, right? Um some um members of his um former collective Treyway. So there was a lot of charges thrown at them, a lot of them to do with organized crime, a lot of it to do with organized crime specifically. They uh, putting them in general pop amongst people who were necessarily, you know, be looking for them to arrive and would want to enact their vengeance was didn't seem like a great idea. So it, it seemed like to me at the time that the, the, the police were doing or the feds were doing that as a kind of ruse to kind of get him in gem pop, scared the living daylights out of him, right? Because they didn't mention in the breakfast club interview that he was afraid of two things it god and the fbi so get him get him to you know get a third on the list you know uh fellow goons who have nothing to lose right because he's been able to kind of exist in the outside world trolling everyone under the sun and kind of always skirting on that line between you know um putting his life in danger and also providing entertainment value for the legion of fans he has online but he's never had to kind of, it seems like he's never had to come across somebody who generally lives and dies by the sword, right? Lives and dies by that street code, lives and dies by that street lifestyle way. They don't see, their future is 
their future is the streets. They don't see any way out of that arena because they've actually chose that life or the life has chosen them, whatever way it goes, right? But he hasn't really been put into, it seems like he hasn't been put into the vicinity of those kind of people, right? Who don't care that he's like a well-known rapper. They just want to like, you know, um, um, get an enemy out of the way or they want to get some, or they want to just grab his plate of food and eat, right? So they want him just out of the equation. So maybe the the feds kind of thinking behind it was like, hey, let's put this kid who kind of thinks he's a gangster, hangs around with very um certified um you know criminal figures, get him in a general population prison amongst absolute lunatics, right? Um, and people who want to do him harm, have them scared the living bejesus out of him, right? Him fearing for his life constantly. For, imagine, I'd imagine half an hour goes by very slowly in the prison right <laughs> i'd imagine so i'd imagine they don't really have i'd imagine the prison the prisons probably don't have that many clocks on the walls right like same as like casinos you know casinos don't really have clocks on the walls so you don't know what time it is you can just gamble your life savings away and you better off and once you finish through that you can gamble off your kids tuition fees away um i wonder if prisons have the same thing i guess you wouldn't really want to know the time would you if you're in prison you Know that you were sitting on your bunk six hours. You kind of want to ten time dinner and maybe count down. Because when you do watch documentaries about prison, you do hear people mention weeks that they've right. They don't necessarily mention days. If I'm thinking correctly. I'm pretty sure they don't mention days. They usually mention weeks. But yeah, so maybe the plan was to get him in there, have the goons scare him, and in. In an effort that he would get so scared and he'd be so panicked that he'd want to snitch on his co-defendants. Because there's also another story going around doing the rounds, right? Because, it, as I said, I mentioned in the other video, it, it just seems really weird that someone in a 6 position, position, right? Um, Rise um, would kind of go, go from being an absolute nobody, right? He'd go through several um, kind of a style and music um evolutions over the period of time right he kind of had that period where he was looked like a fuck boy you know that famous picture where he's drop coach pants then there was a couple of videos where he was kind of like a kind of did that emo sort of rap stuff like kind of like similar to bones right so he had like bleached white hair he didn't have as many tests as he has now and he was doing kind of loads of like you know again loads of kind of like um emo i said emo i say more so goth type music and then obviously he evolved into his final form which is the rainbow colored um, gun toting gangster, right? So th there is a theory going out there that supposedly he wasn't as involved as it seems, as the racketeering charges um, have it seem, right? Per, you know, sometimes when they write these, put these charges on paper, I was charged with ABH one, ABH one, right? Because I had a fight in a park, right? On paper, that makes me sound like an absolute nutcase, right? I sound like fucking. Um, Mike Tyson reincarnated, but I just got into a fisticuffs with somebody of football, right? And that was it. Literally, that was it, right? So sometimes um, charges on paper can make you seem a bit more nuts than what you are, and sometimes can make the charges seem a little more sexy than what they actually are. So there's a theory going out there that he wasn't as involved as as it seems, and he really was trying to, and he didn't know how, and he couldn't really kind of get himself get his um, himself out. And the moment he could get himself out, when he realized that the money was getting stolen, he wasn't getting as much money as he should have, as he mentioned in the Breakfast Club interview, he saw it was a good opportunity to kind of press the button and eject. But obviously, you know, savvy savvy um, watchers or savvy um, listeners or people just around the culture would be remiss to mention that even if you weren't involved, hanging around with street guys, you can't just decide that you want to leave and quit. It just doesn't work like that. I would imagine so. Again, I have no experience of being streets in that capacity or knowing anyone who lives that lifestyle, but I'd imagine you just can't decide to just quit. Oh, I'm going to stop now. You guys are, going, are being too crazy, especially when you're bringing in money, especially when you're um, giving each, each gang member a platform to you know, do their own thing, right? Um, Shorty, for instance. Kind of like it's quote unquote uh you know it's quote unquote like the the label head of Treyway. He's kind of got kind of gained notoriety off the back of the whole six nine rise. People would have anyone known who shot it was outside of the New York tri state area, if not for six nine. Imagine if you're shot in and six nine turns around and says, Oh, you're all fired. What's your natural inclination gonna be doing if you're a gangster? 
you're not gonna take that well are you you're not gonna be like oh you know what good luck on your album release on friday yeah right? hope everything goes well and i'll see you around the way like you're not gonna say that you're gonna be like what what the fuck are you talking about get back here man you're gonna pull him by his hair and tell him to sit down to his pockets isn't it um or you put bullets in him and all that malarkey so it seems like the plan has worked pretty well for the feds they put him in gem pop they scared the bejesus out of him because you know another story leaked recently that supposedly he was beaten up or some shit right um which i think is probably fake news that got out way too quickly um but again you know people inside might be selling info to get money and shit he's, a, he's got a big target in his head blah 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 blah, blah. But overall, it's just an interesting, it's just an interesting case study for what not to do with a career. I think in both cases, even if Six Nine ends up getting off, getting off this, and he ends up snitching um, on these co-defendants, which is another interesting part of it as well. Going, but by going a case study, I wonder, right? Um, we're living in an era, right, where you know, previously, if 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 a if a hip hop act, a hip hop rap, a hip hop rapper specifically an act, hip hop artist hip-hop a rapper in in, in hip-hop let's say for, let's be specific a rapper in hip-hop was uh found out was revealed that he did he or she didn't write their raps or didn't write as many raps as they thought we did right or if they made it or if they gave the impression that they everything that they put out and then it came to light that they didn't in years gone by that would be you out right that'd be you cancelled you're finished right and it's not like a social justice warrior thing it's just you know the art um of hip-hop or the um beginnings the kind of origin story of hip-hop is the whole idea behind somebody sitting down and writing a rap right putting words together trying to make them rhyme and then trying to say those words off the top of your head on a beat and trying to stay on beat and trying to make a melody you know hook chorus da 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 there's all these things that constructed it, but the main basis of it was um, rhyming words, right? Writing down words that rhyme together. So when you find that someone doesn't do that writing process and just performs it, it kind of skews a whole like, hey, you can't be the best rapper, right? You can't be the best hip hop rapper because you one of the fundamental elements, like you know, like breakdowns and like like graffiti, you don't do. But as the Meek Mill and Drake situation proved, people don't care as much as um, hip hop purists would want them to care, right? Hip hop is now kind of, and partly it's due because of the you know the consumers, and partly it's mostly to do with the fact that hip hop isn't a new um, genre anymore. You know, back in the day when it was just KRS One and all those kind of dudes, right? A bit of a niche genre where you know you were kind of flexing your rap rapping capabilities. That that kind of um, criteria of judging who the greats were made sense. And nowadays, hip hop being what the number one genre, which it wasn't before, right? It's quite hard to judge people on that same criteria when they're having to appeal to a, what, a far, far broader audience that hip hop had to appeal to back in the day. Right? It just wasn't the same thing. Back in the hip hop, didn't have to appeal to such a broad audience. It live in its own ecosystem. Right? There were moments when it kind of crossed over. Right? Around the MC, Beastie Boys, uh, Snoop Dogg for, for a certain extent being good examples of this. But for the most part, it kind of was able to exist in its own little niche. But I really wonder. Nowadays, right, with that being a thing, right, you don't, you can't get cancelled if you don't write your own raps. I wonder if this might be an also a good case study for a rapper who goes to prison, snitches, everyone knows, and then comes out and continues their career and nothing happened. Because we kind of saw the similar sort of thing happen with Richard Kid, even though it's kind of slowed down for him. I don't really see him as out as much as much as I did before, but maybe that might be due to legal troubles, might be due to of just taking the foot off the pedal but rich the kid and little uzi vert when they had that little scuffle at starbucks right where they were chasing around the counter and everyone saw that rich kid was wasn't on fighting right he didn't want to fight uzi vert. he was he was he was scared at that moment right maybe he was scared for his life because he little uzi vert had friends with him but little uzi kind of gave the from the from the video he gave the impression that he wanted to fight it right i don't know what problems they had but they have problems he wanted to fight him he didn't want to fight him it didn't really do nothing, right? Usually in the past, if you would have saw, I don't know, if you just saw, name a rapper, right? Jim Jones running away from somebody, right? Running away behind the counter, he was scared to fight somebody. That would really, really damage Jim Jones' career. Like, he probably wouldn't be able to recover, right? It's really damaging. You see Jay-Z running away from some guy, right? You'd rather see Jay-Z try and fight 
lose badly than seeing him run. You won't no one wants to see that. So I think I wonder if the six nine thing might be a good case study to see just how far hip hop has evolved that he would come out snitch. Because if you know if 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 fucking Zayn Malik end up snitching on one of his former bandmates in one direction, no one will give a fuck, right? No no one would bat an eyelid. Right, people would give him a documentary. He'd be there in a bow tie, talking about how he was, his life was in danger. Right, no one would give a fucking ball like what happened. Imagine, imagine what happened with six nine. Uh, but again, I guess for him, I guess for his own ego, for his own pride, because you know, if you watch back some of the interviews with six nine, he takes a lot of pride in the fact that he doesn't listen to advice. Right, he doesn't listen to it. He doesn't go by. Doesn't listen to. He doesn't go by what um. The general consensus is he doesn't agree with general consensus because effectively his skirt in the general he's kind of middle finger approach to the general consensus he's kind of unrelenting pursuit to troll the whole world has got him where he's got to right so you can't necessarily tell him anything right um in the same vein as trump because obviously i've read the trump book um uh, fire and fury by michael wolf you kind of get the impression that trump um um loves he kind of bask in his ignorance he enjoys the fact that he doesn't know certain things for him it's like a it's a bit of a not i wouldn't say a sport but he enjoys kind of pressing intellectual buttons because he knows that you know he he knows that he doesn't know what they know but he's got the job right so six nine is sort of in the same sort of position right okay you guys don't tell me i should chill i should take it easy i should kind of grow up i should leave the streets behind but Streets are kind of, it's kind of what got me here, right? If I just keep ramping this shit up, it might keep going and going and going. And when it stops, it stops. Because I said before in the other podcast, like, I think the kids nowadays, they don't really give a shit. I think they are in the same, you know, like, that's why some people would argue, you know, there's reports that came out about American football being really bad for you. There was a few reports about football, too, about people heading the ball and it's bad, you get bad brain damage, you get CTE, blah, blah, blah. But a lot of former athletes will tell you that kids don't give a fuck how much evidence comes out telling you that football, American football, rugby, all this stuff is really bad for you, right? Um, in the long run, because they're only showing that they're only seeing the short term, and they think the uh, juice is worth the squeeze. They'd much rather have a five-year career, right, playing uh, in a Premier League, earning thirty grand a year, and setting up their family for for life, or allowing themselves to buy their parents a house or to get a new car or I don't know, just live that lifestyle. They'd much rather have that and then get the brain and deal with the brain damage after than not have it. It's just one, it's just simple as that. So these kids just want the likes. They want the clout. They want the tension. It's, we live in an attention economy, right? This, that's essentially where the whole influencer thing comes from, right? It comes from the fact that brands, uh, are unable to garner our attention in the same way they did before, right? With billboards, with magazine adverts, uh, radio ads, whatever it may be. Those conventional marketing uh, techniques didn't work. Um, don't work the same way they did in the past, right? They don't have the same engagement. But if you really want to talk to people, you have to talk to them through the people they champion, people that they look up to. You have to kind of slap your logo on the back of that person and hope because you look up to the Takashi 69, you see a logo of, I don't know, Popeyes on his chest and you want to buy Popeyes chicken. Right? That's what they're kind of banking on. So the brands know that it, how valuable uh, an influence and the kids who want to be influencers know how valuable it is to be an influencer. This is worth the squeeze. So if it means selling yourself out, if it means potentially going to prison, if it means being looked upon as like a social pariah, like a bunk that goes around and steals fucking uh, donuts from Dunkin' Donuts and shit, it doesn't matter. As long as you can get on, the kids don't care. So I wonder if that don't care about how you get on attitude um, is existing and it's permeating the culture and everyone's seeing all these influencers getting free stuff and everyone wants to be an influencer, everyone wants to be a tastemaker, everyone wants to be known and have a name, reputation. I wonder if that's lingering in the air and then 6 9 who kind of perpetuate this image of a gangster. People didn't think he was a gangster, but, you know, the racketeering charges proves that he, even though he might not have been, you know, on the street selling rocks and shit he was in and around those people so you know he lived that life per se if he comes out and snitches will anyone really care i think not i personally don't think so 
I think there'll be some hubbub about it online and stuff, but I think for the most part, it won't really stop his trajectory. I don't think so. In the ways that it would have maybe in the past. I just don't think it would have stopped it. No way. It might, you know, you might invalidate your comments in some regards, but I don't think it's going to stop you completely. It's the same way with Drake with the whole uh, Meat Mill situation and Quinton Miller. People don't care, but you can't necessarily say, you can't necessarily have Drake in a conversation as the best rapper alive because we know he doesn't write some of his raps, right? So it's that's fine. And I guess if you're fine with that, that's cool. But that's the most that's going to happen. No one's going to stop Drake from not put, from putting out an album, doing a show. Uh, are you crazy? Like, he just completely wrapped up, what, 55 shows recently now for the Drake, um, Drake and Amigos tour thing that they did, right? 55 fucking shows with that amazing stage design. Insane. But yeah, I don't know. Let's see what happens. Um, like, uh, so he's been moved to another facility, 6 9 I think I've spoken about him a bit too long now already. But it's just an interesting case, isn't it, overall? Um, let's see where it goes from now on. Um, hopefully, a resolution is made very soon. And I guess, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, he's, he's obviously brought this upon himself. It's not like a woe is me story, but it's just, you know, it's just sad to see somebody that was going one way and all of a sudden they go, yep, you know what I mean? Like, it goes crashing down. That's that's the sad part of it. Not the fact that what he done and you know that's sad. Oh, he lives in a ghetto and you know it's because of the economy and oh, he's a grown. He's not grown up, but you know he he made sure he made some choices. He he kept making the wrong choices that were giving him the right results. So you know you can't really blame him sticking with it, even though it was kind of a bit foolhardy. But you know, let's see what happens as the case develops because I'm sure some interesting things will pop out of the wood. Let's see. Anyway, what's next on the list of topics to speak about here with your lovely Pippa? Oh, Pusha T concert in Toronto shut down. Oh, this was a good one. So Pusha T's in Toronto now performing, um, uh, touring, doing his thing. He probably was one of the standout performers, even though Kitsy Ghost were amazing, right? It was so good to see Kanye perform live. Um... I think after all that nonsense, after all the political nonsense and the Trump and MAGA baiting and the Candace Owens Association and and the free thinking baloney and all that nonsense, it was just nice to see him just do, just perform, right? Just to kind of, you know, put out great art, right? It's the same way how I got a great feeling when Wave Runners come out or I see Yeezys or I see New Collection, or I see, you know, um, ideas on packaging for CDs and stuff. That's what used. To, that's what used to get me. Um, that's what used to kind of interest me when it came to um, or pique my interest. That's why I'm a Kanye West fan, right? The creative output, right? The unrelenting pursuit for perfection, like um, his approach uh, to crafting music, right? The 500 hours I went into my beautiful dark twisted fantasy, right? Um, all that stuff is what I love. The political side of it, I could give two. Sh- previously, but. You know, I, I don't look, I don't look, I don't look for my political hot takes from Kanye. That's what I'm not looking for. If he, if he ends up uh, developing some along the way, cool, no worries, man. But he's not going to replace people who I do look to for hot takes. Not going to happen. I, you know, arts, all that stuff. I'll stick with him, and you know, believing in oneself, and you know, his approach to media and all that malarkey, I love. But political stuff, I can do without. But Kissy Ghost was amazing, great performance. Uh, um, Kid Cudi and Kanye in that um, suspending um, rectangular cube thing for fucking sick. Uh, just in general, just the care that goes because again, you know, watching those kind of shows, especially when you know, I'm, I'm into most of these guys that are on quote unquote SoundCloud rapper dudes who appear on Rolling Loud and all those other festivals, and even the Tyler's Creators festivals, a little bit more um, musically minded. It's quite refreshing to see an actual hip-hop act that takes uh, a real, you know, takes pleasure in design, in stage designing, as much as they do in making music, right? You saw a lot of that with Tyler Crater stage design. Awesome, too. Really played really well with having a stage design that kind of, with one massive projection that you could kind of project stuff onto. Tree, um, the tree house and stuff, like, loads of really cool ideas. So, you just, Kissy Ghost was one of the probably stand-up performances because, you know, we haven't seen Kanye and Cuddy perform in a very, very long time. I've ever seen perform since he kind of had that mental breakdown mid mid tour. 
that was great. But Pusha T might have been one of the standouts because Pusha T, for the most part, isn't somebody you'd imagine would be a great performer just because of the kind of music that he makes, right? Um, that kind of hip-hop drug talk stuff um, that's incredibly slow, right? Most of it is like under 90 BPM. Um, um, very bass heavy, right? Um, not many kick drums and s well, not with well, the snares still, don't get me wrong, but it's not very fast paced, right? Um, you'd imagine it won't be that great of a live show, but watching that stream live and quite, you know, reading some of the comments on forums and stuff, a lot of people were surprised by how good of a performer he was, just standing on a stage um, and rapping his bars. And that was another thing as well about his performance. Like, no, no, uh, no audio backing track, just straight vocals. I mean, just straight, like, he, him actually, because, you know, usually when you see a hip-hop show, the rapper will be on stage and he'll be performing the track that you hear on, that you've got on your own MP3 player or on your iPhone. He'll be just performing that track, shouting over the track, basically, right, with the vocals just lowered. So maybe the D, if he's got a DJ with him, the DJ will lower the mids or the highs and just so he'll, so you won't hear it as much, but you're still hearing the song, which is annoying. But the upper echelon dudes like Kanye, uh, like Drake, they actually um, perform with like a backing track that might have the chorus um, on there, right? Only, um, but to kind of like help them with their breath and their energy, you know, rapping the entire um, verse. But Pusha T was rapping the entire verses of tracks, like no, no, no help. It was insane to see. I was like, wow, really, really cool. So that really caught me off guard. And just in general, the stage, I love how it was, it was minimal, there was min minimal lighting on the stage. You could hardly see him until the, the camera kind of zoomed in. But you could kind of see his figure kind of, um, um, uh, you know, in front of the lights sort of thing. It was, a, yeah, so there was no overhead. I don't think there was any overhead lights. The lights were just coming from behind him. They kind of illuminated him in a kind of weird shadowy figure, loads of smoke. So you got to, you see him moving around the stage. We don't actually see him. Really amazing, amazing performance. Anyway, people filming in Toronto, and of course, you know, some absolute donuts decided they're mega, mega Drake fans. They decided to kind of chuck beer at him and get all, you know, pissy wissy. I've got a video here actually that kind of links to it. I'm going to play. And you can kind of hear the nonsense. I don't know how big of a Drake fan you've had to be to do this, man. Like, imagine being a grown up, right? And uh, an adult, an adult of like good age and wanting to defend Drake's honor. He doesn't know you. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Ugh. Anyway, let me get this up here quickly. See if I load it. Right. Yeah, I just think it's a bit. It's a bit nuts, really. But you know, have their things that they love to do. Is it? Come on. Load the video. So I guess. Yep. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So took a fine couple of these videos of him. Yeah. So. I don't, I don't see what the attack of the beer was all about. Um, but anyway, the attacker that did it got absolutely battered. It was one of those rare occasions where, you know, because sometimes when you see those videos, it's unfortunate because, you know, the rapper might have to, or the artist themselves might have to, um, you know, get involved and start throwing hands. But it seems like Pusha T's security were absolutely on it, like on it like Sonic and kind of end up, you know, snuffing the dude. Um, some stories came out saying, you know, he, he actually got beaten up. But when you actually watch the video itself, you see, no, he did not get touched. I'll play this first one here. That. There's no, no sound here. Back on here, see if I can load the sound quickly. But yeah, let me see if I can load a song. Having some technical difficulties here with this pin. These settings on these Mac sometimes can be set so many things at the same time. Like set that, set this, set that, audio this, a la 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 la. God damn it. Okay, where are you? Mm -mm -mm. That. This one, yeah. Output. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, what's playing there? I can't hear that. Can I hear that? I can't hear that. Well, anyway, this is the video I'm showing online now. I'm going to just show it. No point showing the... Because that's not working. But yeah, the guy absolutely gets battered. Gets stomped so hard. 
So he gets loads of water gets rained on Pusher. He's still performing. He's like, you know what? Fuck it. He does a little shoulder shrug, moves out of the way. Many, many cups of warm plastic beer are being chucked at him. I don't know why the guy decides to run on the stage, though. He tries to jump on the stage to kind of further go with the attack. Ends up getting absolutely smashed, right, by some gorilla security dude. They're trying to pull him, beat him up more, but they're still banging him, right? He's still getting beaten up. Boom. Blow again. Another blow. Another blow. He's getting absolutely smashed. And then he runs, but he does well. He runs off the stage. Managed to run out. I guess he kind of escapes briefly. <laughs> I'm just thinking, imagine how much of a fan of Drake you have to be to do this, though. Like, I love Drake as much as anyone, but fuck that. That man can fight his own battles, man. Like, this is absolutely insane. Um, Supposedly, Pusha T came out. I, I think Julian Palmer said something along the lines of, like, oh, this guy sent his goons to come rush me or something on the stage, right? He's shouting that. But I'm sure this... I, I don't know. I'd hope this has nothing to do with Drake. I'd hope this is just like overzealous fans, you know, in the same way. Remember those kids that went and ran and ran up on Joe Budden and uh, was screaming at OVO and then Joe Budden came out in that, in that vest that had seen better days and started running down the street holding rocks in his hands. I'd hope it would be the same sort of thing. Overzealous kids or young people thinking, you know, look at this. Yeah. Another video of it as well, another angle. Absolutely. I wonder how you leave the stage, you leave the arena knowing that that, that happened to you. Bloody hell. Absolutely insane, isn't it? Do you know what? Let me just go it. Play. Working for. I don't know where. I don't know where. Or maybe because of this. Kia. Here, change the volume settings back to a normal Mac, and then we'll be ready to low. But yeah, and Pusha T is not the smallest of dudes. He's quite a, well. It quite. It looks like a quite. A, not, not that build should play any part in whether or not you should fight somebody. So like you've you know got a defender on of an artist you've never met in your entire life. Cringe, but. I don't think Pusha T would be the person I'd want to run up on stage. On, I, I, you know, it's like it's, you've seen those videos with fucking Gucci man and his security guards. What they do to people when they try and run up on stage is absolutely insane. Some of it is a bit LOL because I'm sure some of those kids that run up on there by now know that some of Gucci Mane's security guards are beast, so they want to get viral. So they'll just go on there just because so they can get slammed on the floor. I'm sure of it. You know, those white boys that are into jackass and shit, they love doing that stuff, but. I wouldn't want to do this like push a t-shirt, man. A bit nuts. But yeah, I think I think after that he came out and performed infrared after the, the first event of beer chucking. I think the first dude that comes on, he he performs and after that he performs a whole infrared and then I think he has to leave because you know the the, the venue people get a bit tetchy. But yeah, standard hip hop shit, innit? Um Oh, he he did finish the show. Karen Civil's got a video here. He finished the show, it looks like. Okay. Fair enough. One man on stage as well, by the way. Which is pretty cool. No dancing monkeys or anything. I quite rate that. In the same way that you have to rate like a Jay-Z performance. Whenever you see a Jay-Z performing, um, you commanding the stage and just being an absolute boss. You have to you have to really, really hold your hands up to him because, you know, or tip your hat to him because it's just, you know, it's Jay-Z. He's not the most, you know, um, swaggy dude in the world, right? An amazing rapper who's made some of the greatest songs in hip hop, but for the most part, he's not going to be, you know, moonwalking across the stage or doing the midi rock and shit. He's just going to be rapping, and he his stage presence is fucking awesome. And he doesn't really have that many bows and whistles either. He's not got like seventeen dancers there unless he's performing with his wife, right? He's mostly just like it's just him just rapping into a microphone, which is fucking. So you have got to really respect that. So that's that's fucking awesome. And as you saw a lot of that too with Drake. You know he runs across that platform quite often. He does have a good stage presence, but I look at those videos, like that kind of ability to just kind of captivate you just for the pure, you know, um, interaction with the crowd and just 
moving around the stage and rapping instead of actually you know doing loads of madness of course the stage design itself is the bells and whistles but you know the idea that he can actually just stand in front of a mic you can have the mic and the mic stand and still probably slay right and you see that a lot happening quite a lot especially when we did the, that blog party thing you saw kind of the power of drake's performing because just standing on the front of a table you know behind the dj front of a dj sorry, for the most part so yeah Pusha T is no pussy, um, performs even when people chuck beer at him and he has an impeccable shoulder shrug. I mean, just whoop. And people who go to concerts um, of of people, of um, rival rappers who they like or something and you defend rappers' honor, you are an absolute donut. That's pure dork behavior. Going to a show, paying you hard earned money to go and chuck beer at a rapper you don't like. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, that is nuts. That's absolutely nuts. Um, yeah. But whatever. Pusha T's okay. Everyone's okay. Everyone's okay. Next on the list. Warehouse Project's Final Dance New Year's Day 2019. That's always pop up and just, just kind of just made me think about New Year's Eve and New Year's Days. Um, Warehouse Project, which is a famous venue in Manchester is in the, is going to close well it's going to move from its current site into a new site but they've kind of booked an amazing um set of guests for their party for the day and just kind of it kind of reminded me of you know the fact that i don't have actually have plans for the whole nyd thing and the merit of plans whether or not you should plan for stuff should you just kind of like go with the flow and it's weird because the last few years have been kind of samey in terms of like not having a plan, right? I've just kind of gone with the flow. I think last year was the year we went to, you know, blow up some fireworks on top of a, on top of a friend of a friend's um, very, very nice apartment in the middle of London. So we, uh, we kind of saw the kind of city skyline for lack of a better term um, or skyscraper line. And that was really nice. It's funny by hanging out just having a good time that was quite cool um there's been other occasions where i've gone i did the whole like buying a ticket for a rave and attending it and that was quite cool i've done the whole um going to a warehouse party thing i've done the house party thing i've kind of covered the whole rem remit of parties or things to do when it comes to new year's day or new year's eve but sort of like my opinions on halloween i kind of detest the that day or that period of time because like much like Halloween, um, everyone and their mum comes out, right? Because Halloween is one of those rare occasions where people that don't come out, the unsociable ones, right, the ones that um, abstain from going out to nightclubs or to bars and stuff after a set time, you know, they kind of let their hair down. They're like, you know what, fuck it, I'm gonna be a slutty nurse and I'm gonna get fucked up. I'm gonna do drugs. I'm gonna dance, right? So you've got all those people, right, who don't necessarily go out like that right because some people say they party like what do you mean you party do you party party or do you just like you know have a little wiggle as you're going to go order your mojito at the bar right that's not partying right i mean like going for it for real yeah getting on it on it like sonic right but those people are mixed in with people like me other people those people and it's an absolute shit show of a, of a night usually for the most part halloween's like you know i can count on one hand the halloween parties i've been to that have been good that being said, I can count on one hand the Halloween parties I've been to full stop, right? I can count on one hand the amount of Halloween parties I've been to full stop and also worn fancy dress. But the point remains that, you know, it's not the best time to go out usually because everyone under the sun is going out. Uh, promoters all over London are scrambling to put on a great event. Um, there's fierce, fierce competition um, and also an overabundance of options also um the fact that you have to pay a lot to get to these places you, you know, paying is not a problem but the fact that you have to pay quite a bit it's a bit of a premium right new year's eve new year's day events um tickets get jacked up in some venues even the drinks get jacked up um i've heard stories i remember when i used to work at um a particular brand store one of the security guys who were all very friendly with would tell us like amazing stories of like them take of his of because he used to manage a security firm um they used to take home like is the even new day like grand at a time or hundred pounds right because um eager beaver punters would want to skip the line and the security guard would tell them yeah if you give me 20 quid i'll jump you 
five places in the line, right? Of course, the punter it, that that's been jolt, that's been um, jolted in a queue isn't going to say anything. Good behavior. He wants the punt, bouncer to let him in because you know that's a weird thing you don't really get in Europe. We get mm, Berlin. You kind of get that sometimes, but not really. Um, they sometimes confer with the bouncers, but for the most part, in places like Berlin, they have a door picker, right? Who picks a says yay or nay to come in and sometimes they'll kind of confer with a with a bouncer or sometimes you'd be at a club in berlin and the, i don't know the door picker girl boy has gone to the toilet and then you dare they're at the door and they might kind of like you know uh, cover the person but for the most part the, the picker kind of chooses in london it's different it's like the security guards are quite are essentially the, the gatekeepers of nightclub which isn't a good idea right but the most like some most most security guards who have met don't even number one don't drink right Number two, don't even go out like that. Number three, don't really have a, you know, don't have the, I think, the necessary appreciation for nightlife that uh, us punters would do in order to kind of make, in order to kind of make an informed decision. And also, they, they're seeing the absolute worst of humanity, right? Completely sober. So, you know, it's not necessarily the best judge of um, whether or not someone should come into a nightclub or not. But, you know, at least we said that, you know, I'm him telling us that he is taking home grounds at a time because people want you so you know you've all got all these kind of imagine the kind of person that would offer a bouncer 50 quid to jump in front of a queue i'm sorry isn't the kind of person i want to go to a party with okay um, point blank period so it's not necessarily the best time to go to a nightclub but you know it comes around usually if you're working an office job you kind of close up the office you know mid I mean, towards the end of December, so you have like quite a long time to kind of, you know, you might be working from home a couple of days, but you have quite a long time to kind of, you know, um, you have quite a long period ahead of you before the New Year's Eve. And if you are a normal human being, you might have a family or people they're going to hang out with to have Christmas dinner with. You'll be reminded of how boring that shit is. And you just want to get out and on it as soon as possible. But sometimes New Year's Eve, New Year's Day can take an, a, another it can take its it can it can rise up in significance just because you're reminded of how boring family are right you just want to get out with your friends and get absolutely smashed you don't want family talking about trump or brexit again time right you're going to be out having a good time so even though you don't care about new year's eve or new year's day it just comes across it just stumbles across your path again you're like oh hello old friend it's you again i have to decide where i want to go what outfit to wear blah 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 it was a bit of a headache. Um, so this year, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Probably going to go to the floor again. Take it easy. If nothing transpires, just chill. Um, I don't necessarily want to go anywhere. I was There was part of me that was thinking to do a short trip to Berlin and come back. But I had a quick scan on tickets on Google Flights. Which, and again, I recommend you check that out. Google Flights is really cool. I used to, I used to be a sky scanner dude. But I think Google Flights is a little more simple. Um, UI to use um, or UX, I don't know, UX experience or user space. But I just love the way it's designed. It's super clean, super plain. As you imagine uh, um, what any kind of Google interface looks like. But essentially, you get the, what I like about it is that when you search for a flight, um, the dates that you search outbound, um, um, inbound or outbound, you get to see the price underneath the date. So it's a little, a nice little design, little tweak that it has on guys kind of you have to click the day and then kind of the price you get kind of an average price but you don't get the actual price per day on on google flights you get a price for each day that you you want to come back or each day that you want to leave it's really cool to kind of like um get things all listed up and then once the list comes up like every other site has different times different airlines blah blah blah. so it looks like that it didn't really seem a viable option to go to berlin spend like a 500 quid to go and party and come back doesn't then so I might, I'll, I'm, I'm definitely going to be staying in London. Um, I don't know what I'm going to be doing, but this this event, which kind of spurred my whole idea, uh, my whole kind of thoughts on what I should be doing, is the Warehouse Project's uh, final event. I stumbled across on Resonant Advisor. So it says here, Warehouse Project confirms lineup for the last ever party at Store Street. There's something really magical about going to the last ever event or something and the first of something, right? really cool i had the, obviously the same the recent experience of doing that on both ends i went to the final the first um fold party right the fold the new 24 uh nightclub in in canning town and then also went to the last alibi party right having been you know going there for about four to five years so i'd like i'd like a cool little you know experience of that 
um, when I went to the club called Libertine um, Berlin, which I don't think is at the site that is where I was at now, where I went for the first time, right? There's a, something really magical about going to the first, uh, especially anyway, only for club kids. If you're a club kid, you know what I mean. If you're just a regular, regular schmegger dude, you probably will think like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? Why is the first club kids? But there is something quite magical about going to the first event, the sound not quite working out, the toilets a bit fucked up, like just the rustiness of it, and then coming back again later on, especially when the staff are still the same or whatever, kind of acknowledging that you are still, you are the OGs. It's something cool about that. I don't know. I just have very romantic thoughts when it comes to, comes to surrounding myself, which feels such a profusely because of the uh, copious amount. But whatever. Um, Where well, project confirms final lineup for the store for the store street party. Uh, the twelve hour the twelve hour event will take place on New Year's Day uh, with Black Madonna, who's been absolutely everywhere this year. She's been she's probably the um, um, MVP of the year, isn't it? Black Madonna. She's been absolutely smashing it this year. Um, Honey, who's got obviously the residency like so wild that I fucking missed to go to last week, and I'm probably not gonna see when it before it finishes, which is annoying, but I hope to. Um, Objects have got a new RA mix out at the moment, and Debonair, who's someone that I've been meaning to go check out. Uh, people say she's an awesome DJ, but yeah. Um, as it kind of continues, a twelve-hour uh, event dubbed the End of Store Street will begin at five PM on Tuesday, January first. Acts include Black Madonna, Honey, we'll go back to back with Daphne, Giles Peterson, Palms Tracks, Object, Seinfeld, Shanti Celestine, Los Rubenstein, who's um, I listened to a couple of her mixes. She's fucking incredible. Um, th- th- she's actually playing alongside uh, Perez at Mix Garage. I'm gonna actually go to that. I think on December 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 fifteenth. So I'm not that worried. I'm missing this. But yeah, I re- recommend you check out Dr. Rubenstein. Like amazing DJ. Um, Dr. Rubenstein is spelled D R R U B I N S T E I N. Amazing DJ. Um. Debonair, Bradley Zero, um, obviously who a lot of uh, London heads would know. Uh, Deck Mental Sound Systems, Cornell, Kovac, Cornell Kovac, and Melody and Artwork, which is nice as too, right? Um, and Artwork Performers Grain, sorry. The Manchester promotes relationship with the venue, which is the car park during the week. So stretches back to 2007. 2011, Wires Project moved to another venue in Victoria House before returning in 2014 to Store Street, where it's been held since. According to co-founders, Time has come and there'll be no return. So that's the kind of final move. Hopefully that they, they get a permanent space. I'm assuming they will do. Um, you know, having moved to kind of come back and forth, which is amazing, really, isn't it? The kind of sp- the utility of the space. Uh a car park during the week and it transforms into a nightclub. I guess it's amazing for the story, right? For the, the you know, the story of sustainability, but I imagine running an actual nightclub that's you know flying in DJs from all around the world a professional nightclub probably gets annoying having to kind of split the duties between a car park and a warehouse but yeah that's kicking off new year's day um um warehouse project if you're if that's what if you've been looking for plans then that might be a good option i think train tickets to manchester and back for that particular party are going to cost you around 80 quid the tickets to go are like what was it 35 pounds right so not a bad night out if you'd want to venture out of London. I'm probably not going to do that. I can't really necessarily be bothered. And um, for the most, even though I would love to see Black Madonna play, I'm, I can see Honey at XOYO. Black Madonna, I'm sure, will be back later on sometime um, during the year. And the one I really wanted to see was Dr. Rubenstein, who I'll be able to see at Mitz Garage. So I'm probably going to hold off on seeing that. But this is a really good event. Um, go support Warehouse Projects. One of the most influential, influential clubs in london overall i mean in the uk overall let alone europe right so yeah I recommend you check that out in my uh new york new new year's day the end of store street presented by warehouse project on tuesday the 1st of january 2000 from 2 right 2 in the afternoon until 3 a.m the next day mate absolute bonkers affair I recommend you check that out um that's that. What else is on the list here? Bum, bum, bum. Illegal raves are on the rise. Well, fucking duh, right? So this is a good little segue talking about clubbing and going out. This kind of report came out recently. I think I've mentioned it or two. I saw it earlier too. Um, before we kind of dive onto the actual article itself, just some kind of anecdotal 
know, just some you know observations. In. You know, the, L- London's had a bit of a weird relationship with nightlife, you know, for a while now, and um, it kind of seemed like things were getting better when Sadiq Khan was made mayor and he introduced, you know, he kind of floated this idea of turning London into a, a real twenty-four hour city, introducing the twenty-four hour tube. And the kind of, you know, the general consensus around the 24-hour tube was that if you're, if you're going to implement a 24-hour tube, you're going to have to um, acknowledge that the night, nighttime economy, nightlife economy, is plays a substantial part in, you know, the overall GDP in London, right? Even let alone the UK. So there's efforts around it. Um, but, you know, for the most part, politicians, for the most part, local councils have had a very taut relationship with the nightlife economy because, you know, they live in these councils, they live in these boroughs. Um, they 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 kind of had to bear the brunt of some of the um, some of the consequences of having uh, a lot of nightclubs in a concentrated area, especially when it's next to red areas, right? So they they're necessarily for the whole twenty four hour um, London kind of thing, but you know you'd hope a compromise would be reached some way somehow. Unfortunately, that didn't transpire. And recent events with Hackney Council kind of proved that they passed a law or a bill that kind of um, required new venues and new venues, bars, um, bars and clubs for the most part were targeted. We were only allowed to open until 11 p.m. on a weekday and 12 a.m. on a weekend, which, you know, knowing any kind of knowing how metropolitan cities work, knowing how people move around spaces, knowing, you know, um, people's habits when they're gonna go out it just seems so counterintuitive it just didn't it boggled it boggled belief right because that's the kind of thing you expect when you go to like a small leafy town outside of london right it makes common sense you know the pace isn't as quick as it is here but to go to go to london and hang out with your friends in a cool bar somewhere in hackney and for your night to end abruptly at 1 a.m because no open is really really dumb right um, again, I hate to mention Berlin again, but uh, you could go to a really cool cocktail bar um, that happens to serve some good tapas that will be serving food until f- sometimes two at a stretch, depending if depending on if the chef liked to, right? You, you could probably get something to eat. Yeah. You could probably stay for drinks until four, right? Most places. So imagine a, a, the same sort of outfit in London existing being only uh, uh, be only allowed to be open until 11 uh, and then 12 uh, on the weekends like how are you going to make money how are you going to pay the staff it's just absolutely insane and then extend that kind of same parameter to nightclubs right who are having to um, jump through many many hoops in order to kind of keep their doors open um, having to apply for special licenses in order to kind of you know stay open until 2 or 4 a.m like ooh. So there's been a very taut relationship but again i have sympathies for the people that live in these boroughs because they're having to deal with people sick in front of their doorways and piss all over the sidewalks like i understand it i get it but sometimes when you enact laws or you enact, or you kind of side with one side without looking at the other side right because you know hacking council um or for the most part was, um kind of vetoed through even against some of the actually right they kind of had it heavily favored to residents you know I don't live in Hackney Council, so I can't really comment on that. Really, I don't know what the what the inequalities of it are, but there seems to be no real compromise in the, in the middle. And there seems to be, if you kind of the entire document, there did seem to be a, a big, a much a big push, Hackney Council to kind of uh, change the landscape of um of the businesses in and around there, right? The closures of the Alibi, the closures of the Visions. Uh, close of a few other places kind of showed that you know they were slowly but surely trying to squeeze the life out of some places, place them with restaurants, uh, places that were the kind of manager to control, quote unquote. But sometimes yeah, there's unintended consequences, and the unintended consequences is the article we're going to speak about right now. So you close, so you tell you tell bars and restaurants that they can only close open until eleven and twelve, and then what ends up happening? Uh, young kids get resourceful they gather their resources and start putting on illegal parties because they want to stay out longer right or they want to come out later whatever it may be so this is a report from sky news it's you now um police warn of growing illegal rave problem as mer as numbers soar 
right? Um, more than eight, more, more than yeah. So let's read the report here quickly. Police chiefs have warned illegal raves are a growing problem after forces revealed they're tackling hundreds across Britain each year, which is you know makes sense. Like I, I don't have to, I don't have to look just outside my window to Hackney Wick area, the places um near once of flats, and every weekend there's a party. Um, it was. There was a time in the in the middle of summer where I'd just go out to Hackney Marshes and walk around and hear the bass and just party. I didn't before I kind of found the relevant groups and relevant link check and kind of um, make sure where I was going was right. I'd just you walk into the park and you'd hear the bass and you go over there. Little by little, they start to get hard and hard to find them that way, but they're happening all over the place. Um, and they're kind of and they kind of and they've been hosted by very professional outlets, so kind of bringing whole sound rigs with them. They're, ad hoc bars and stuff like it's a very very well old machine <laughs> more than 680 reports of unlicensed music events were recorded last year uh, and uh, up nine percent from the previous 12 national police chief um said illegal raids were inherently unsafe and officers had to consider the safety of residents when deciding whether to shut events down it comes after the police face criticism for failing to stop a massive illegal rave in welsh village in berthshire which reportedly attracted more than 1,000 people in may Again, this is unintended consequence. When you limit the places that people can go legitimately, they are going to find illegitimate ways in order to kind of continue their fun. It's just one of those things. And I just think in general, I've mentioned it a few times, people haven't necessarily agreed with me, but I just think lo- the UK or London overall, we have a very weird relationship when it comes to nightlife, um, when it comes to alcohol, when it comes to drugs. It's very strange. Um, there's, there are some very, like, I have pubs in, near me are frequented by the same 10 or 12 guys who are there Wednesday to Sunday, rain or shine, getting absolutely fucked out of their brains, right? And it's not necessarily looked upon um, any sort of, you know, bad. But when kids go out and take drugs in a nightclub, right, the parents get immediately worried and want to shut that place down, right? They kind of associate uh, only negative thoughts with idea of young uh gathering dark uh into like that gary sitting in a spoon wednesday at 9 a.m fourth guinness as he stared into space that's not an issue well it's not as much as an issue. again it's not what what about what about is a thing it's just like the prize are really weird things that we choose to worry about are really strange anyway let's continue with this article um it comes out the police face credit um the uh, da, 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 da. caroline caroline evans who have who lived near the illegal rave site said police failed to attack quickly enough to stop the event but come on caroline how are they going to stop a legal event quickly there was a lot of mess human feces i love the word feces <laughs> drug bags cans and bottles what do you know what a drug bag looks like hey susan how do you know what a drug bag looks like um by the time the police arrived it was already well established imagine saying the word well established in a sentence all right isn't it rave was reported the rave was reported to police in the early hours but officers didn't get to the main junction where people were parking their cars until the next afternoon the next afternoon <laughs> again i'm saying this taking a mick because if i lived there i'd probably be pissed off but come on susan close your curtains and go to bed guy news asked each of the uk's 45 turn around Territorial police officers for the number of legal raids reported in the last few years. Just 14 officers, 14 forces in England and Wales provided annual figures, meaning the actual number of illegal raids is likely to be much higher. Overall, number of legal reports rose. In one case this year, Jordan Gahib, 26, was jailed for 21 months for violence order, and several police officers were injured in illegal raving bar. Yeah, that's minor. Right? Bang, bang your doors, Jordan. Get free, gang. What was that? He's got a. He definitely does music, isn't it? Guys that have a tattoo of that, what's that? What's that note? You know, in music when you have the note before when you're writing uh, sheet music. He's got a nose ring. He's got a nose stud and that kind of tattoo. Well, he's mentioned eye drop as a music thing. He definitely does music, rapper or something. Um. Anyway, Deputy Mercer Police said it recorded 180 crime incidents related to raves, including complaints about noise and social behavior between 2018 and 2018. Um. And yeah. I'm not surprised, man. It's a long article. I'll link to it in the, in the show notes so you guys can check it out yourself. But I'm not surprised. These are the unintended consequences that happen. Sometimes they're well-intentioned decisions that people make, right? You don't want human feces 
on your doorsteps and your flat in Shoreditch. But sometimes that could also mean that kids are going to rock up at that in that park around the or behind your garden and start throwing on parties there because they can't go anywhere safe. And what's going to happen then? Then you're going to have dodgy figures um, selling shitty drugs in those places because people can't, you know, because the people that would sell drugs in a park wouldn't necessarily get into a rave, right? Wouldn't necessarily get into a nightclub. And you're just putting those kids' lives in danger. It's just these loads of unintended consequences that happen, right? Um, the devaluation, the devaluation of the area because it's loud and kids throw legal house raids everywhere and they're fucking up property and all that stuff. Stuff happens that people don't actually realize it's going to affect you overall. But yeah, I'm not surprised, man. I think in general, we have a weird relationship with nightlife. I don't know why it's like that. Don't ask me why. I think maybe because Catholic and blah 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 go save the queen but yeah we're strange when it comes to raving that malarkey anyway um an hour has been reached getting late and um, you know usually when it gets late, start rambling about stuff you shouldn't be rambling about so i'm gonna cut it short and end it right here but before I do, I'd implore you to check out my site at eggsnowzinger.com for updates on what I'm doing. Um, if you're wondering in terms of DJ gigs and all that stuff, um, in terms of other stuff that I do, in terms of writing, I did. Um, I made a little um, review of a breakfast place that I that is near and dear to my heart, or is near where I live, for the lemon and olive. Is it lemon and olive? Olive and lemon actually get up on the screen now. I'll show you dudes and lasses. So um check out my site exnozinger.com for updates on what I'm doing um in and around the London and UK area as per usual. Um just find links to my blog, which is defaultgoon.com. And on that blog you shall see a post like this on screen, which uh, is a review that I did of a restaurant near me or of a cafe called um olive and lemon not the olive and lemon oh my god i actually wrote it wrong on here which is fucking cringe and then kind of embarrassing but yeah the olive and lemon olive and lemon <laughs> cafe and shaffer but you can check out some of my um misspelled blog posts on here um grammar mistakes are part of the process but yeah check that out on the uh, on the links attached below i hope you'll be doing another podcast before the end of the week um actually DJing on friday to one tap piece as per usual um but yeah i'll see you guys again on the other side for another episode of the action of Zinger show this has been episode number one two four as always check out my sponsor that is at audible.com for slash aggie that's audible.com for slash a right to claim book credits was a trial 400 000 titles to choose from those are books read by your author or there to choose from i'll see you guys again very soon for another episode of the action of Zinger show but for now Thanks so much for tuning in. See you again very soon. Peace.